All right, so my name's Alex Wilson, and I'm going to do a bit of a talk about DNS. Uh, I'm also going to talk about some other stuff, but I'll start with the history of DNS, and go through some technical details about the protocol and its design, and I'll finish up with some lessons, I think, that we can learn from DNS as a system. Now, as I hope you can all, or at least a significant fraction of you can guess from the way I started up my slides from PCDOS 2, the year is 1983. It's a very busy year. Return of the Jedi is released. Uh, Korean Air Flight 7 was shot down over the Soviet Union, sadly. Uh, music CDs have just become a big thing in the, in the States, uh, and, but they won't surpass vinyl for sales for another five years or so. And in three years, I will be able to make this very slideshow using Harvard Graphics on my IBM AT with an EGA card. However, what I'm really here to talk about today, uh, which also happened in this year, was the ARPANET, uh, which is sort of the predecessor network to the internet, has just transitioned to TCP IP. Now, some people get a little bit surprised when I bring this up because uh, the ARPANET is kind of associated very closely with IP and the cultural zeitgeist. But uh, it was actually existing before IP uh, and was originally on the 1822 protocol, which is a technical report. Uh, it added the NCP stuff to that and then eventually changed to IP in 1983. So sort of the second big uh, flag day after the Multics ASCII changeover. So the ARPANET, while we're talking about it, at this point in time is growing very rapidly. There's another host popping up on the network about every sort of 10 to 20 days, which is, equates to tens of new hosts a year, which is an amazing rate at this time. The current population is about probably 250 hosts. It was hard to get a firm number on this, but it's about enough to fill a Class C subnet. And each host on the network from the very beginning had been given a host name. Uh, these in the ARPANET days were a short, mostly alphanumeric string, could have hyphens in it as well. A lot of them were prefixed with the name of the university where the machine was running. Uh, so here's some examples like BBNW, FNOC, MIT Comet, SU Fuji. These are all real machines in 1983. Um, and the way you got one of these names and an address on the network was you had to ring up on the phone ISI and you had to uh, report your machine's details and they would give you an address and a host name. And then the following morning, they would publish a new version of a file called host.txt. Host.txt was on a machine called SRENIC, which was a PDP-10 running 10x. Uh, and every morning, ARPANET operators were obligated to go and download the new version of host.txt from SRENIC. And this was how host resolution happened, how you got the address from a particular name. Now, of course, the main use for resolving uh, addresses in the ARPANET in these days was to be able to run email, which was sort of the killer app, I guess, for, for the ARPANET to begin with. However, email in these days is a little bit different to what you might, rec what you might recognize today. In particular, email addresses looked very different at this time. Um, because originally, email is based pretty much entirely on the UCP style email, email addresses, which are what's called bang paths. Rather than describing where the email is actually going to end up eventually, they describe the entire path it has to take to get there through the network. So you're sort of being a human router when you're, when you're addressing your email. So as, as an example, this one here has MHTSA, which will then, so you're sending the email through MHTSA, which will then give it on to IHNSS, which will then give it on to IHXP, which will eventually deliver it to the email of the user on IHXP named Gurg, or Greg, I think that's meant to be. Um, so the reason why this was important was because in UECP, often these machines were not permanently connected. Uh, IHNSS and IXP may only talk to each other once a day and to catch up on all the email that's gone through since then. And so you may want to route it a different way, something that does an hourly dial-up connection, and so you have to know about that as a person. Just fine. However, the ARPANET had a different vision of how email was going to operate, and the way they wanted to do things was to do routing uh, in the network layer and not inside the actual email services. So they wanted you to be able to just tell it where the email had to end up, and it would find its way there through the network. So in order to sort of further this agenda, there was a, a meeting that was held at ISI, which was the Great Computer Mail Meeting, in all caps, uh, which was RFC 805, where the original idea of doing absolute email addresses with a user at and then a host, which was your final destination host rather than a route to get there, was proposed. Now, in attendance at this meeting was a man by the name of Dr. John Postel. Uh, who was very notable and was <laughs> repeatedly called the god of the internet. Uh, he was the editor of the RFCs and involved in a huge number of, of stuff to do with the ARPANET and then later the internet. Now, this dovetailed very conveniently solving this problem into an agenda that he had already going, which was to get rid of ISI's role in managing host.txt. Because managing host.txt by this point with tens of hosts coming a year is a pain in the butt. So 
in the tradi great tradition of academia, uh, Pastel decided that in order to solve this problem, he was going to find a postdoc and trick him into doing it instead. <laughs> the postdoc he found was uh, Paul Mokopetris, who was a newly minted PhD at ISI at the time. And together, they ended up spending the next few years basically trying to solve both the problem of doing absolute email addresses and also getting rid of ISI's role in, in host.txt. When they started looking out for ways to, to solve these problems, they started looking at prior art and what people had done in the past already. Now, one key particular system that they looked at and that influenced what they did was IEN116, uh, which was a protocol designed by Pastel himself earlier. It was sort of an experiment in remote access to the host.txt file. The idea was that instead of everybody having to sync down the entire file every time, you could just send a query to, the, to SRENIC and say, hey, I'm after this particular name or this subset of the file and just download that. It's a very simple protocol and a very simple spec. You can fit it on a couple of sheets of paper. Um, and in fact, it's a little bit too simple. Uh, there's quite a few arguments if you go back and read the mailing list argument, uh, like archives at the time about how to do things with it, particularly like uh, wildcard lookups and how to represent some kinds of information which just wasn't covered because the spec was so small. Um, it is, however, very, it's, a, it's a binary packet format over UDP. It's still centralized, so ISI would still have to manage the database. It's not great a fit on its own, but it does provide some of the, the ideas that they were looking at at the time. The other key thing they were looking at was a system by Xerox, which was called Grapevine. Now, Grapevine was interesting because it had a more decentralized uh, authority. Uh, basically, for example, you could delegate control of the names ending in MIT to MIT, or something similar to that. Um, it was, however, very deeply integrated with email and directory service. It was basically designed to provide a directory service for the entire internet. So you could look up someone by name in their university department and find their email address and everything about them. Um, it's also similar to, to IAM116. It doesn't take, it takes some of the load off ISI, but it still means everything is stored on s pretty much, because the, the central storage of the database uh, was still a thing with Grapevine. However, it did delegate control to the other, to essentially like remote access for people to be able to edit the file without the NIC having to be involved. It's also a very complex spec, uh, and like unfortunately a lot of other work that came out of the same lab at Xerox, uh, they never really designed it to interoperate with anyone else and didn't publish necessarily in their papers full specifications for how to talk to it. Instead, it was more about the general system design and how it was put together. So between these two things, which are sort of the two key influences on what they decided to do, uh, they came up with this idea of a, a hierarchy of names. Uh, and what they wanted to do was to delegate authority in different parts of the namespace to other organizations so that ISI didn't have to be involved and didn't have to be involved in storing any of them. And the idea they came up with was a, a system called domain names. And you're probably familiar with this if you've used the internet much. But their idea was to have at the top the ARPANET itself and then be able to have the ARPANET recognize that there's MIT and USC underneath it. MIT can have hosts of its own like Comet and TAC here. And USC can have ISI and have nick.isi under that. And the system they came, with, uh, came up with for writing these down, which was not just their work, by the way, it was sort of floating around some of the ideas about this at the time, was to separate them by periods and put them left to right in order of most specific to most general. So in that way, the host names read out like this, like nick.isi.usc.arpa. This isn't actually an example of uh, what the namespace was going to be, but there were a lot of proposals floating around at the time. Now, one thing I find very interesting personally about the DNS and the time in which it grew up is that at this time, there's actually relatively little formal study out there about uh, distributed systems, which was what they were proposing to implement. Um, they, uh, around this time, a bunch of work started happening, um, but there's no FOP and possibility result yet. There's no cap. Um, there's nothing uh, formal to, to reason about as far as trade-offs between consistency and availability. However, a lot of the ARPANET guys and a lot of researchers in the space at the time had a very deep, intuitive understanding of that uh, trade-off. It's particularly apparent in Marco Petros' emails where he explains that DNS is going to have to be available, and as a result, it's going to have to sacrifice some consistency guarantees about the names you get out of it. The other interesting thing I find at the time is that it's uh, not just a protocol spec that they came up with. A lot of specs at the time with the RFCs were sort of focused on the network protocol that was being uh, produced. However, the DNS spec is notable in containing not just the protocol, but also the roles that machines can play in the, in the system. 
uh, the, the ways they communicate, obviously, the algorithms that they have to obey individually if they want to actually create total system correctness. And this focus on the whole system and the properties of it as, as a unit, I think, is quite interesting. Um, so I'll go through the system design. Uh, the system design kind of mirrors the, the data structure, which I showed you two slides ago, which is uh, the hierarchy of names. I'm not going to go back to it because changing slides is a pain. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that at each level of the names, uh, there's a server responsible for answering questions about it. And each server in this so-called authoritative tree can either serve records, like it, it's, it has answered your question, or it can serve a referral to the server that's one layer down. Um, in this way, by starting at the root of the tree, you can follow it down to answer any question you have. So if you're after the nick.isida, blah, 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 uh, you would start at the top uh, with ARPA. You know, already know where those are, and you go down, you ask ARPA, sorry, uh, where's MIT? And it says, MIT is here. It has this, uh, this is the name server to talk to. You go to MIT and you say, what's this name? And it gives you back the final address. So all you need to know to start this process is an address of one of the root name servers at the top. However, Following this route down at the time was seen as very expensive. A lot of this was just due to the fact that machines at the time were very slow. Uh, reading, reading some of the early mailing list posts about the DNS implementations, it was pretty typical for queries on like a, a TOPS 20 to take seconds to respond. Um, so I didn't want to have all the clients having to do this all the time. Um, so the solution was to give authoritative servers in the DNS the ability to set a time to live on any answers that they give. And then we can have another role in the system, which is one of the roles they set out in the, in the spec, uh, which is a caching name server, which can keep a copy for that amount of time. And the thing it's keeping a copy of is actually a total answer to the question, rather than all the interim steps to find it by going down the tree. So this also then enables another type of role in the system, which becomes very important, which is what's called a stub resolver. And a stub resolver in DNS actually has no ability to walk down the tree from the root. It doesn't actually know how to do that. It doesn't know where the root servers are. Instead, all it knows about is a caching name server that's nearby. And it uses that caching name server then uh, to ask all of the questions on its behalf. Now, the idea was to have probably one of these caching name servers per university campus or corporate campus or something similar to that. And this ability to have uh, uh, participants in the system be really minimalistic and just ask entire questions actually becomes uh, one of the most important things that makes DNS successful, in my opinion. All right, so let's have a look, quick look through the actual protocol itself. So the DNS protocol that they proposed in their MIMO uh, in 1983 uses UDP datagrams, and it's a binary structure inside the datagram. It looks a little bit like this. So there's a header at the front of the datagram, followed by four sections. The four sections are question, answer, authority, and additional on the left here. The question section obviously contains the actual question that is being talked about. Answers contain answers to the question. Authority is a little bit more confusing. It contains records that indicate why the name server is responsible uh, or why, why the name server can answer that question. Uh, the additional records are any extra details that the name server wants to throw in to help you out, basically. Um, the idea of the protocol in general is that as a resolver, you'll send one of these datagrams out with all the sections empty except question, and then the name server will send you back uh, the same thing but filled out with all the other sections with the, having data in them. Um, this packet format uh, is basically designed to handle all of the possible interactions between the different roles in the system so that they're all speaking in the same language. It's also designed to be quite flexible. Uh, and if you look at the contents of one of these sections, like the answer, uh, it, this becomes particularly evident. In here, you can see that each uh, record in the answer section has a type and also has a length prefix. And in that way, if you don't recognize what the type is, you can still just skip over the data without having to interpret it. And the spec actually goes out of its way to tell you and specify very explicitly that as an implementer, if you come across a record that you don't understand, especially if you're something like a caching name server in the middle, you need to pass it on verbatim even if you don't understand what it is. Uh, this, in this way, basically, the protocol can be evolved in, uh, over time by only changing the original authoritative source of a record and the end client. Those two components upgrading is enough to understand a new type of data in DNS without actually having to upgrade everything in the middle. And this is important for an internet scale system to be able to actually continue to operate. Now obviously the types of records you can get in here, the most basic type is an IP address, uh, which is just 
a simple data about where to find the name that you asked for. Uh, and you can also contain in here information about how to send an email that has at that name, which is how they tied in the idea of using the absolute email addresses to this. So when they had this spec drafted up, uh, they had the RFC done, um, they sent it out to a mailing list, uh, which was called Name Droppers, uh, which was a mailing list basically devoted to discussing domain names and, and these the details of them at the time. The early talk on the mailing list quickly focused in on the email aspects of it and UCP. Uh, there's a really great email in here from one of the UCP uh, developers, basically, uh, where he describes uh, John and Paul as arponauts with their heads stuck in their very expensive government-funded sand and how there's never going to be a connected network and everybody's going to be dialing up to each other asynchronously forever. Um, <laughs> Some feedback they got in this stage evidently was uh, not so important in the long run. Uh, but there were a lot of uh, valuable uh, stuff that they received back from the mailing list. There's a lot of uh, repeated corrections and drafts to the spec that go through. Um, and this all happens uh, over the span of uh, a year or two in that time. Now, from the beginning, they, uh, from the first memo, they started on a draft implementation uh, for the TOPS 20 originally, which is called Jeeves. Um, there was also a subsequent implementation for the TOPS 20 called Chives. And then eventually, in, uh, by the time of about 1985, 86, uh, we see Bind, which is the first Unix implementation for the PDP-11. This is actually a thesis project at UC Berkeley, over the other side of the bay. Um, after the students had moved on who originally worked on it, uh, DEC took over maintenance of it, uh, and then Vixie et al., who have been looking after it through to today. Today, BIND is probably one of the most important implementations of DNS on the internet, uh, simply because it had a huge amount of market share through a lot of maturing faces of the internet and has set, basically, a lot of the expectations about DNS software. Speaking of today, um, DNS is everywhere, basically, at this point, and it mostly works. Uh, generally, it seems to be doing pretty OK. Um, UECP has kind of gone the way of the dodo. I don't even think the UECP website's up anymore. Uh, so it turns out they were right to ignore that. There have been some difficulties with DNS, a bit of rocks in the paths. Um, in particular, there's been two decades of work on DNSSEC, which is basically trying to bolt uh, cryptographic security onto DNS after, uh, after it's been deployed. This is still far from universally deployed, but it's sort of getting into a state where a lot of big providers are starting to look at it. Um, there's been a lot of change in DNS, but over this whole time, it's managed to, to stay backwards compatible. All the enhancements have been added, basically, by adding new record types and doing it in ways that don't require everybody to upgrade at the same time. And I think, even though it's not a perfect system, I think the 33, 34, almost years of it running like this have shown that it to, it, it to be tremendously successful as a system. So I want to talk a little bit then about three or maybe four lessons about, I think we can learn from DNS about building systems, especially distributed systems. And I think lesson number one is to focus on the problem. Even though the DNS spec was a little bit under-specified in some places, it didn't end up mattering so much uh, simply because they were well-specced in exactly the right areas. Uh, and they did this by focusing on what the problem was and understanding it deeply before they started writing up what they were doing. Uh, I think the second lesson is to be boring by default. DNS didn't really do exciting things with its packet format or the way it operated. The software that was written was pretty boring. It was using established technologies the whole time. I think being boring is valuable uh, because it gives you time and concentration to focus on what should really make your solution interesting, which is the problem. And interesting, the interesting parts of the problem should result in interesting behavior. I also think it can teach us to avoid solutions both that are too simple and too complex. Because if you look back at the IN116 and the, uh, uh, the, the grapevine design, um, when you have solutions that are too simple, the greater system that forms around them just ends up consisting of people putting things in and out uh, on top of it, basically. You end up like only specifying part of the system, and something else grows around it. And when you have a system that's too complex, instead, it stops being able to evolve and change. It can't last as long because it can't be altered. There's too much risk involved. So I guess what I really love about DNS uh, is that over the, the 33, 34 years it's been running, it's managed to succeed, become an important part of our fabric without any serious problems that have caused it to be scrapped or, or completely redone. It's managed to maintain compatibility the entire time. And I can only hope that anything I build today would be as successful and, and long running as DNS has been. So thank you. <laughs>